Okay. Hello, everybody. Sorry about that. Technical difficulties, 705. We're only five minutes late, so I'm glad you're with. Hope the other people that were there come back. So anyway, welcome. This is Jimmy, Veganic Grower, Veganic Growers Hour number 15. Can you believe it? it's the first day of September? And I don't know what it's like where y'all are at, but here it is feeling like fall. It's uh, 16 degrees was the high today, almost 60 Fahrenheit. And wow, it's, uh, it's supposed to get down to about seven degrees tonight. So what, 44? Uh, so it is awfully, awfully cold. So here... The fields are deteriorating. They're 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 decaying rapidly. Our season is winding, winding down. Um, but the great part about it this time of year is there's much preservation that's happening. So we're we're canning tomatoes. We're drying tomatoes. We're drying wild mushrooms and going to gra dry ground cherries. And we're going to make hot pepper sauce and. Uh, Mexican style salsa. So all the goodness, all that hard work that we did going into this season is now uh, coming to fruition in the preservation ends of things. So our autumnal and winter meals are, are going to be quite blessed with all this summer harvest that's coming in. So um, in addition to all that, we're, we're, we're freezing celery and parsley and sweet corn and sweet peppers. So it's just a fiesta over here with all the last, which, which brings us down to tonight's show, which is all about gleaning the harvest, post-harvest handling, and more preservation ideas, especially on the lesser known, um, the lesser known way. So Let's get into it. Before we do, though, uh, we have a question uh, that came in that really is about harvesting, but that's okay because gleaning and harvesting are kind of one in the same. So the question is from Jean from Nova Scotia, who's with us tonight. How come my, ta my tomatoes have hard green shoulders? I have to say, Jean, that is probably because it's a variety type. There are certain varieties of tomatoes that just happen to have those hard green shoulders, like uh, I can think off the top of my head, Cosmonaut Volkov, Muscovich, um, even Rush Times, and another one that we have here, Quebec number 13 or Quebec Tries. So yeah, it's, it's really just a variety type. Now, what you can try and look for are tomatoes that don't have those green shoulders. So one couple that I'm thinking offhand are Brandywine red, brandywine yellow, both of those never seem to ever have the hard green shoulders. Also, um, some orange, an orange tomato called Valencia, which is an heirloom, which is quite wonderful. Green Zeba, which is a, a striped green, yellowish green tomato that's really, really nice. Um, so look for those variety types. Usually you can see, if you see pictures on YouTube or on Google or YouTube, and you're looking at pictures of tomatoes, they will actually show those green shoulders. It's just, again, it's just a characteristic of the tomato itself. Um, I don't know what kind you grow. Maybe you can let us know and uh, maybe we can help you work it out. But I, pretty much, I don't think there's any de deficiencies of nutrients. I don't think it has anything to do with lack of water or too much water. I think it really just has to do with the variety type. So thank you for sending those questions. As always, I appreciate your questions. I love answering the questions. It is my favorite part of the show. We only have three left after this. So ask your questions. I love to answer them on the show. So bring us to the first topic tonight, which is gleaning. It's a very interesting concept of the harvest. Um, and I would like to take a shout out. Hello, Toronto Vegetarian Food Bank, and hello, Jorge from Mexico City. Glad you made it. That's really cool. Welcome. 24 degrees. It's balmy down there like it is in Nova Scotia and 27 degrees. Um, so we're talking about gleaning. And what gleaning is, it is basically taking in all the fruits and vegetables and herbs that are left on the plants that we particularly want to harvest when we see the temperature start to fall or when the rainy season comes in hard and before the disease starts setting into the plants or on the leaves itself. A great example is kale. If you get too much rain at a certain time of year, 
uh, all of a sudden your kale plants can start getting like leaf spot on the leaves, kind of a kind of a mildew. It's best to start thinking about picking off those leaves before that, because what we're going to talk about in post-harvest handling and then next week's show, which is long-term storage, we're going to discuss how you can take those kale leaves and you can keep them in cold storage for up to a month, six weeks, even two months, depending on how well you store. So if we can do that, then we're harvesting all the goodness of the summer without losing any nutrition in, in, in the process. So it's very, very cool. So the very first objective tonight is to talk about gleaning. I'm going to go ahead and make a note on time. So, yeah, so think about, if we think about the natural world, and we think about our natural friends here, and we think about the chipmunks and the squirrels, they're all doing the same thing. Now, here we are in the north, and the leaves are starting to turn, and it's starting to get cold, as I've already mentioned, and all the beings that live here are starting to think about what they're going to do when it gets really cold in the late fall and winter time. So, you can observe in the forest, and it's a very, very wonderful thing to do. You can observe the chipmunks, and they will go and all that we have like a, a choke cherry. So when the cherries start getting ripe, you'll see them and they're eating and they're eating, but they're also taking them. And what the chipmunks do is they go ahead and they put them in their little, they have their little hibernation caves. And within these caves, they have little chambers and they go ahead and put. Now there's 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 some discrepancy out there about what they do. So if they harvest, say, the choke cherries, and they also take mushrooms. And they also take seed heads from whatever seeds. Let's say that it's a tournesol um, a sunflower plant. And they take the sunflower seeds. Do they put them all together, like in one big melange? Or do they have separate chambers? Well, they say they put the cherries, they put the sunflower seeds, and then they put the, se the seeds of, um, uh, what did I say? Or, and then they put the mushrooms. Me, I think they have all separate chambers that they go ahead and keep everything separately, but maybe they do. Maybe they make like a muesli with everything. And when they get hungry, because chipmunks hibernate here in the winter time, then maybe when they get hungry, they go ahead and eat. Anyway, this is the philosophy of gleaning. They're taking whatever's ripe, whatever's ready before it goes rotten. And they put it in a place where it starts, where it can stay nice and cold. Um, so I want to say hello to Margaret from Saskatchewan and again, Toronto Vegetarian Food Bank. Hello. Good to see you guys. Thank you, everybody, for coming. So here's some examples for the human world. Um, we like to go ahead and start harvesting as soon as those nights get cold and, and, and soon we're going to start seeing the freezing temperatures come in. So sweet peppers is a very interesting one. Obviously, sweet peppers do not reach their sweetest potential until they are at least 75% red. They don't need to be 100% red to be, um, to be at their sweetest point, but they do need to be at least 75%. If they're 50%, then half of the pepper is going to be sweet and the half the pepper isn't. But when we're talking about the cold temperatures and we're talking about gleaning, we want to bring all those fruits in. We want to bring all those peppers in to the cold room and put them at 33, 34, 35, 36 degrees Fahrenheit or two to five degrees Celsius so that we can go ahead and enjoy those peppers for as long as possible after the cold weather comes. This is gleaning. So when the cold weather's come, we start seeing that the frost is coming. We'll go ahead and strip the plants. Gleaning, stripping, same thing. We'll go ahead and strip the plants. Any pepper, sweet pepper that, that is, is, is nice and formed and isn't tacky, isn't bumpy, then you know that it's in its mature state. If it has a little bit of color, more power, it's not going to turn anymore, but it will go ahead and um, hold that nice sweetness that it has at that point. Now, hot peppers are an interesting point because if they are turning already a little bit, so if you're talking a cherry bomb pepper or a cayenne pepper, if you're into hot peppers, and they're starting to turn, and you pick them halfway turned, if you put them in your cold room, put them in your fridge, they will turn all the way. It's just the facet of, it's just the facon, the way, the way of the hot pepper as opposed to the sweet pepper. Very cool. I love this. I love this kind of thing. Now, tomatoes are also something that we will strip. We'll strip all the green ones. Anything that's well-formed, anything that has the slightest blush, the slightest, slightest tint, we'll go ahead and harvest it. 
I'm going to talk about tomatoes a little bit more in post-harvest handling, but before I get there, I might as well just mention it now. If they're green, you can stack them. You can, you can put them in a box where they're stacked up quite high, but if they have any color at all, the best possible way to store your tomatoes is to go ahead and store them on a single layer, no colder than 55 degrees Fahrenheit, so 13 degrees Celsius ever. Otherwise, they will get mealy. Don't put them in the fridge. Don't put them in the cold room. It doesn't do anything for them. Um, and if they're too warm, they're going to ripen too fast. But if they're about 13 to 16 degrees Celsius, 55 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, it's the perfect temperature for those tomatoes to ripen off. So it is interesting to do that if you, they, sometimes when you harvest them green or with a little blush and they start turning, they're not fantastic to eat fresh, but they are absolutely amazing to make in the sauce, put in your chilies, go ahead and cook down the pizza sauce if you like making your own pizza. So there are many, many ways to use those tomatoes after you've stripped off the plots. Continuing on, um, some a little bit less commonly known, uh, winter squash. And this actually brings up another question. And this is from Stephen here in Quebec. When is the best time to harvest winter squash, especially sweet Georgia candy roaster, which is like a big banana squash? So all winter squash wants to sit outside on the vine until they are rock, rock hard. You're going to knock on them. It's like knocking on a, on a hard door. That's how you know that the winter squash is ready. It may not be the perfect color yet, but if it's hard, it's as, it's as hard as it's going to get. It's as mature as it's going to get. It will continue to ripen, turn color in the field, but if like here you start getting a bunch of rains come in or the nights get really cold. Winter squash doesn't really want to get below about four or five degrees Celsius or 40 degrees Fahrenheit. You're going to, you want to cut them off. You want to cut them off and you want to bring them into a sunny location. So we put them in our greenhouse. You can put them in your house in a south facing window. And what this is going to do, this is what's called curing the winter squash. You can take a spaghetti squash that's rock hard, but still kind of green with sort of some stripes through it, almost looking like, oh my gosh, it's never going to turn into that beautiful looking yellow spaghetti squash. And like magic, you can put it in your greenhouse, you can put it in your south facing window, and it's going to turn yellow, uh, completely yellow. It's, it's, they're doing it right now in our greenhouse. The same with Sweet Georgia Candy Roaster. Now, all of those squashes, even if they look like they're 100% ready outside, they still want to be cured off for two to three, even four weeks in that sunny condition. It can be really warm. It can be 27 Celsius. It can be 30 Celsius. That part doesn't matter. It's the sunshine that it needs, even if it gets warm. After which, and we'll talk about this in post-harvest handling a little bit more, after which you want to stick them into a colder place. But all of your winter squash, Stephen, as long as they're hard, you can cut them, but put them into a nice warm place to go ahead and cure. That's it. That's it. There's the answer to your question. So that would include spaghetti squash. That would include Georgia candy roaster, which is kind of like a banana squash. That would include butternut squash and also pumpkins. You can take a half-turned pumpkin, uh, which is orange and green, and put it in the sun, and it's going to continue to ripen off and it's going to become orange. Very, very cool. Acorn squash is a little different as is delicata squash. Acorn squash and delicata squash do not need that, do not need that period of curing in the sun. They only want two to three days at the most. And then after that, you're going to want to go ahead and put them into uh, a place at like, again, 16 16 Celsius is my preferred for those for those when they're curing. It's my preferred for curing when it when it comes to potatoes. It's my preferred curing when it comes to onions. So yeah, acorn squash, delicata squash, even buttercup. Buttercup is kind of a green, kind of uh, serrated looking or pleated looking squash. Very very tasty orange in the middle. Wonderful, one of my favorites. There's not a whole consensus about what's right. Sometimes I'll leave them to cure. Sometimes I'll pull them right away and put them into at six. I mean, sometimes I'll cure them in the sun. 
Sometimes I'll put them into the cold room right away. You can try it. But for sure, I know that acorn and delicata uh, only need a couple of days to answer your question. Thank you for that question. I love questions on the show. It's awesome. Uh, do I eat my squash skin? Yeah, I eat delicata squash skin, one of my favorites. Um, that one I eat all the time. Sweet dumpling also. Acorn squash. Now, here's a preservation tip. We're going to get this on later in the show. But here are one of my favorites. Let's say you roast your squash and you pierce it with a fork. You know it's done and you, maybe you don't want to eat the skin. Maybe it's a little tough. I'll save all those skins. And when I want to make the really kicking vegetable bouillon, I will put that in with onion skins and garlic skins and the ends of leeks and carrot carrot ends and carrot peelings and parsnip peelings, uh, pieces of celery tops like celery fronds. I'll put, put that in with some water and some salt, boil it for about 45 minutes, and you got yourself just a killer, killer veggie broth. So even if you don't eat your skin, save them, put them in a sack, put them in your fridge, make your own vegetable broth. Preservation tip number one for tonight, make your own vegetable broth with your squash skins that you don't eat. Thanks for that question. Um, beets, carrots, and onions, even when small. So let's say um, here is a great example. Again, so much rain in August. We had almost 200 millimeters of rain. So 20 centimeters, which is eight inches for all you people down in the States. Uh, it's just a ton of rain at a time when we just didn't need it. Uh, the carrots started to rot out in the field. It was too much rain. The, the little carrots couldn't pull it up and the water just waterlogged them. So as soon as I noticed this, we just, we just harvested row run. And what that means is we just harvested the whole patch. It didn't matter uh, if the greens were tall, didn't matter if the carrots were small. We just got everything out of the field as fast as we can. This is so, as surely when you do that, it's sure that you're only going to get carrots maybe five centimeters, a couple of inches. But as long as they're formed and hard, then they're going to be sweet. And as long as they're sweet, then they're going to store. So those carrots are great. They're they're great for your soups. Again, you can put the smallest of the carrots in with your. Uh, it, to make your vegetable stock with your uh, with your uh, squash skins, um, but you can also juice them. You can also just eat them as carrot sticks. Anyway, doesn't matter if they're big or if they're small. Even even if they're small, they're worth it to go ahead and hold. The beets are the same way. If they're a small beet, as long as they're hard, they're going to store all the way until next spring, and they're going to be just fine. You can juice them. You can make borscht. You can do whatever you would like to do with them at that point. Onions are also the same. Um, you can put, you can cut onions in quarters. You can put it into your vegetable bouillon also, or um, you can make a tagine, which is a uh, Moroccan dish where you cut um, a bunch of onions up kind of in quarters. And the smaller ones are really cool for this. And you kind of uh, cook all of cook all these root veggies down. So potatoes and, and winter squash and parsnips and rutabaga and those onion quarters with some garlic and even some like lemon slices. And you can make, you can use all those small onions. So doesn't really matter whether it is small, gleaning it before the inclement weather gets it. This is the point. And bringing it in while it's still at a point when we can store it for long term, which we're going to talk all about in two weeks. So when we're thinking about gleaning, it's not just us that we should be thinking about. We're thinking about all beings in general. So sometimes it is a habit that we have that we're going to want to cut down all of our plants at the end of the season so they can sit on our beds or, or we remove them and put them in a compost pile we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks too that we don't want to do that we want to leave everything on the beds but if you have lettuces that are going to flower into seed and if you have uh, your sunflowers that are going to seed and if you have any kind of other uh, flowers, maybe chamomile flowers or um, onion flowers that are going to seed, leave them. Leave them for the migrating sparrows, leave them for the migrating finches, leave them for the migrating warblers. Everyone who inhabits your neck of the woods will want 
to have a taste before they travel on. And it's so important. All of those seeds are important protein and and carbohydrate sources for those little those little creatures that are flying such great distances to get to get to their winter home. So the more that we have for them, the easier that flight will be. And what I've learned this year back in the spring, if they if if either they or their children or somewhere in their genetic line remember that your environment was a place where there was sufficient water, a sufficient food source, they're going to come back. And to me, that is the biggest testament to how cool our gardens spaces can be for all beings, is that if they come back and you see the same birds come back or the same butterflies come back, then you know that you're doing the right thing. You know that you're creating the diversity that they want. And to me, this is what it's all about. As organic growers, this is what we should be thinking about, not just food for the human kind, but for all kinds. There you go. A little rant. So anyway, yes. So think about all beings when we're when we're talking about if there's anything that can be left for all beings to share, even things like cucumbers. Sometimes we want to harvest all the last cucumbers. Well, if they're weird looking and strange looking, leave them. The little mice will, will like to eat those seeds and eat that uh, eat that uh, uh, the meat of the cucumber um, just as much as you would. So there you go. Leave that. All right, so we're going to move on. We're moving on to post-harvest handling. A story. So I've worked on many farms in my life as well as owning two myself. And a couple of the a couple of the places I've worked has been Hawaii and also in Quebec. I've worked on a couple of farms in Hawaii and a couple of farms in Quebec. And it's amazing to me that you'll have farmers who are exceptionally good at planning, at seeding, at maintaining, at creating just beautiful crops and getting these beautiful winter squash or these lovely potatoes or pumpkins or just bounties of, of summer squash. But in the end, they, they didn't know that you had to handle it appropriately and store it at the right temperatures. Otherwise, it wouldn't last. So I've witnessed, unfortunately, hundreds, up to thousands of pounds of winter squash and pumpkins and potatoes just go to waste because the, the farmers in the regions just didn't, didn't grasp this concept that every single variety, every single cultivar that we plant, that we maintain, that we harvest from also has very, very specific post-harvest handling directions. They don't usually talk about this in seed catalogs and actually gardening books don't spend a lot of time on this either. Uh, maybe they'll just say, oh, clean, dirty, this, that, this temperature to that temperature, but it's almost not good enough. There, every specific one has exactly uh, a specific specific requirements. Brings up two questions. Steve, and I, I didn't get where Steve and David, and I didn't get where David were from, but was on a group that I follow called the Market Gardening Success Group. I've heard that if you wash potatoes, they will not store as long. This is from Steve. Absolutely, they won't store as long. As soon as they're washed, you're taking off their protective coat. You're taking off that dirt layer that's that's on. Sometimes also if you wash them, you're also rubbing off some of the skin. So when you harvest your potatoes, post-harvest handling tip number one, if you're harvesting your potatoes, bring them in, keep them dirty, put them into a cardboard box, and set them into a curing site. Again, favorite curing site, 16 degrees, 18 degrees uh, Celsius, 60 one 65 degrees Fahrenheit, no warmer to that, in the dark, never in, the, never in the light. Keep them in there for, you can keep your potatoes in there anywhere up to three weeks. Take them out periodically and look through them. Sometimes you will have harvested the potatoes and maybe you've cut one and it's starting to rot or sometimes you will just happen to pick one and they will have already started rotting. 
and you can smell it. Uh, rotten potatoes <laughs> smell good. So go through it every now and then. And um, you will be able to know if there are any bad ones in there. Ditch out the bad ones. Go ahead and cure them like that. When it's been about two or three weeks, you're pretty assured that all the potatoes are um, all, all good in their, in their box. Then you go ahead and put them into cold storage, which is going to be about anywhere from two or one to five degrees. Less than five is great. Four is fine. Five is going to be fine, though. If you have it at five degrees, your potatoes will not start sprouting. So the question that comes over just now, we want to save potatoes for seed to potatoes. Do we treat, store them in any special way? No. Again, you just cure them 16 degrees. Take the size that you're looking for. Uh, maybe you want to save them all and worry about it in the spring. But go ahead and put them into a into a cardboard box does not have to be into a plastic bin sealed actually unsealed is better a cardboard box put another cardboard box over the top you don't have to see don't seal it tight and make sure it's at uh yeah one to five degrees somewhere in between there and they will rest there all winter long all fall all winter all the way until next spring if you keep it at that temperature they can actually be in there all the way until june july august doesn't matter um, but if you're going to plant them you're going to then plant them in may so there's your tip another question that came over was from david what is the best way to store beets for the winter well kind of the same way go ahead and store them dirty so we harvest them out of the field here cut off the tops completely all the way down to the bowl um Sometimes the, the, the greens are just not even good for eating at that point. Uh, we'll go ahead and bring them on up. Usually what we use to carry are either those Rubbermaid totes or we have like those old shopping baskets, those green ones with the holes in it. Anyway, we'll bring everything up in that. Some of the dirt will fall off. We'll dump them into, um, we'll dump them into Rubbermaid bins for the beets and uh, we'll Put the, put the lid on them, put them right away into cold storage, one to five degrees. Now, beets can be done this way. Carrots can be done this way. Parsnips can be done this way. Rutabaga can all be done this way. The only thing that I will caution is that every now and then you're going to want to take out the bin maybe once every week or 10 days for the first few weeks. Open up the lid and wipe out any of the humidity. Depending on when you harvested your, your winter crops like that, it's possible that they are going to have um, excess water inside them. And that water is going to transpirate into the, into the Rubbermaid bin. You're going to want to, the more moisture, it's fine that it's humid, but you don't want dripping moisture. And it will. It's it's really interesting to do that. Plus, also, if the temperature that you harvested at was, say, 13 or 14 degrees Celsius, and you put them into something 4 degrees, well, that's also going to transpire, make the, the beets transpire a little bit of moisture. So wipe out the bins a few times, and then they're good to go. We have beets. We still have, we just cleaned out our fridge. Uh, I, about two weeks ago, Melanie just cleared it out about two weeks ago and we still had a bag of beets in there that were perfectly fine. So two weeks ago was what? Mid August. And we stored them in September. Not bad. 11 months. So you can store things a really long time, but don't wash them. Beets are a little bit more forgiving. Carrots are not as forgiving, but beets are a little bit more forgiving as are parsnips, uh, even rutabaga. But I always have just found that if you keep them dirty, it's also a lot less work in the end. You can wash them as you go, as you pull them out of the cold room. It'll just store that much longer for you. So that answers your question, Steve and David. Keep them dirty. Beet sealed container. Potatoes non-sealed. Good. Continuing on. Um, talked about potatoes, tomatoes again. Yeah. So I said that we want to store them single layer in a box. Always do it that way. If you put, put them on top of each other, it's fine, but you're going to have to look through them all. A damaged tomato is a tomato that is not going to, is not going to rest a long time. 
And what does seem to happen is once you start getting rot from one tomato, uh, you're going to start getting early rot in other tomatoes, something about off-gassing from the rot. So you really just want to go through your, 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 um, your vegetables and your fruits periodically in the cold room as you would in your fridge. You know, think of, think of when you go to the grocery store and, or say to a fruit stand, and they're always like rotating the fruits and vegetables. This is just a great tactic. You put the oldest ones in front, the newest ones in back. You don't need to look at the newest ones for a while. But the old one you want to look at every now and then. And even if it is starting to go a little bit bad, we'll cut it in half and use it right away. Um, welcome, Nan. Don't worry that you're late. I was late too. We had technical difficulties, so welcome. A uh, question comes over from Ann. So the potatoes we bought from you should be in the fridge there in the basement. No, 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 no. The potatoes in the basement will be fine. Your Yours are only... Yours are... Um, if you, they're going to be at like 13, 14 degrees and here, even it's going to get colder, it's fine. And if you didn't have any problems in the past, it's fine. I'm talking about long-term storage for like six, seven, eight months. Um, but you no, your potatoes are going to be just fine in your basement. If you want to keep them until um, February or March, then yeah, you would put them in the fridge. But I don't think in this particular case, that's what you're looking for. All right, continuing on, just checking my notes, excuse, hey, don't be stuck together. All right, uh, post-harvest handling of things like lettuces, greens, radishes, turnips, and turnips and herbs. Like I've already talked about in our harvesting of these crops, the early, because all of these cultivars want to be stored cold, uh, they want to be harvested as early in the morning as possible. So we harvest them early in the morning. These particular crops, we all want to wash them off. We want to air dry them if they're lettuces or say bunches of kale or bok choy or bunches of radishes or even winter radishes. Now I'll get to that because it is a little bit different. Uh, we're going to want to go ahead and harvest them when they're cool, wash them off. And then they can pack and then they can pack and they can store a good month good six weeks, a good two months in your fridge. Kale um, is so durable that if you bring it in, if you cold water bath it right away, so kind of dip it in water that's maybe 11, 12 degrees and put it right in your cold room or your fridge, kale can last, and a sealed container, kale can last up to two months, which I just find fascinating. Now, Busting myths. We love doing this on this show, so we're going to bust another myth. Should I store my produce in a bag with holes in it? No, 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 never, never. What's going to happen is the air is going to get in to the greens, and it's going to just start um, causing the greens to wilt. That's why sometimes if you put your carrots in the crisper bin, right? Oh, the crisper bin. And it's maybe just slightly ajar. Well, the air that gets in is very dry in a refrigerator, which is really interesting. It's very dry in a refrigerator, and the 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 dryness is just going to suck out the moisture from your vegetables as it will from your greens. Do an experiment if you don't believe me. Take a bunch of kale, put it in your fridge without a bag. Put it put a bunch of kale in a bag with some holes in it, and then put a bunch of kale in a bag sealed in the fridge right next to it. And you tell me which one lasts the longest. That's going to be the one in the plastic bag because it's guarding the humidity. It's going to keep everything fine. This holds true for parsley. It holds true for cilantro, um, radishes and turnips too. Now I was thinking about winter radishes. We're starting to harvest those here. So things like watermelon radish, black radish, daikon radish, um, or the big uh, purple top turnips. All of those can be stored dirty, just like any other root vegetable. So if it's a root vegetable, like, like we talked about, store it dirty and it'll last a little bit longer. However, because of the hardness of those vegetables, like the hardness of a rutabaga, you can wash them and they will store okay. They're not going to store as long, mind you, than if they're dirty because a channeling tip, you can keep stuff dirty. Um... How about things in the brassica family, like 
cabbages, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, something like this. All of those want to be harvested as early in the morning as you can as possible, but they don't want to be washed. The cabbage, you don't want to dunk a cabbage in water. You don't want to add more water to the cabbage. All these brassica family uh, crops already have a bunch of water in them. So you don't want to uh, add water to it. It's just going to hurt them in the storage. So cabbages, yeah, we harvest them, put them right in a bin, partially seal it, boom, in the cold room, one to five degrees. Same with broccoli. Same with cauliflower, you just cut it, put it right in, sort it. There are always some broccoli. If you're growing broccoli or if you're growing cauliflower, there's always some broccoli, some cauliflower that is got a little damage to it. Well, if there's any damage to it, like cauliflower is a great example. If there's a little black to it or a little brown to it, maybe there was a cabbage worm that got in there and did a little damage. They're just not going to store very long. Only the perfect ones are going to store. Or sometimes you pick up broccoli, it's a little bit past, so it's starting to yellow just a tiny bit. Well, that yellow is going to exacerbate. It's going to just keep getting more and more yellow. So it's best to sort your veggies. Again, you want to go through your vegetables. Just think of yourself, if you, depending on the size of your garden, depending on the, the, the amount of produce that you're bringing in, that you're gleaning uh, in from your system, you need to go through it. You need to go through your fridge periodically and see what you have. Go through your cold room or your or your root cellar or your basement periodically and just see how things are going. You know, take your coffee, go down in there in the morning and just look through your potatoes and go, oh, is there any ones being weird? Is there any soft? Is there any ones rotten? It can happen. If you notice that they're soft, bring them up, go ahead and boil them up and you have your boiled potatoes or whatever else it is that might be, be going over and eat that first. And and this way you'll never, it, even though we're not going to lose anything because it's all going into our compost pile, it's best if we, once we've gone through all that effort to bring it in and to, and to harvest it and post-harvest handle it, we want to eat it. So just take the extra time. What about cucumbers, summer squash, and melons? Okay, so cucumbers, now here's an interesting experiment too. So cucumbers like to run around on the ground when when the vines are running around the cucumbers they, when you harvest them sometimes they have they have dirt on them and to, if you take a cucumber and you put it into a bin dirty and you take another cucumber and put it in a different bin clean like wiped clean the one that's wiped clean will actually stay fresher longer so again you can't just use this general rule of oh all produce should be dirty or kept clean or kept in a bag or not kept in a bag no, every cultivar has a different characteristics. So cucumbers, winter squash, or summer squash, melons, watermelons, you want to wipe them off with a cloth, keep them nice and clean, um, and then put them in a bin. And they should last you, or in a plastic bag, and they should last if they're harvested well and there's no blemish, there's no cuts or, or nicks in the fruit. They should last a good couple of weeks because they are so full of water. They're not going to last much longer than that, but it'll be just fine. Now, melons can. A watermelon, because it's harder rind, will actually store a little bit longer. It's post-harvest uh, uh, post harvest method are the same. Wipe it clean. Make sure there's no dirt on it to, to aid in the deterioration of the fruit inside the cold room or inside your fridge. And the... Um, because of the hardness of the rye, they can last a month in your fridge. A cantaloupe, because it's a little bit, it's a little bit thinner, uh, may not go past much longer than two weeks or three weeks if you're lucky. Um, so think about that when you're harvesting these crops. What about things like bush beans? Bush beans are also something I never ever wash. Uh, maybe some farms do. I think it's bizarre, but. Bush beans will also start deteriorating if they're if they're too wet. So if they've been harvested off plants that are wet or if they had too much rain, they're not going to last as long as if it's been a few days of dry weather when you've harvested them and bring them in. Those want to be stored in, in your post-harvest handling. Those want to be stored in a, uh, a sealed container or a sealed bag, and they'll last as long as possible. Great. So let me see if that brings up another question. No, I have a preservation question. So that is what I have on post-harvest handling. 
really the secret to all of this is, is it comes down to the heart. When we're talking about harvesting, if it's a vegetable that wants to be in your fridge, harvest it as early in the morning as possible. If it's warm when you harvest it and it wants to go in the fridge, cold water bath it, kind of shocks it back to that cold temperature that it likes, and then go ahead and put it into a sealed container and put it into your fridge. If it doesn't need to be washed, things like beans or cucumbers, well, wipe them clean. You can even wipe all your beans clean. I don't, it's a little bit labor intensive, but you can wipe all your beans clean and uh, your, you wipe your cucumbers clean and put those into bags as well. Put them in your fridge right away. Pretty much the universal cold temperature is one to five degrees. Most refrigerators run about three, about 35 degrees Fahrenheit. Really, that is the perfect storage. There's a reason why refrigerators are made that way. It was because we could then store our fruits and veggies longer. There you go. If you ever wondered why there was a refrigerator, now you know. Okay, so moving on, let me just make a note on time. 41 minutes, perfect. Okay, so let's talk more on preservation. We've talked about drying and using the Excalibur dry dehydrator for all sorts of things like uh, ground cherries and fruits and mushrooms, wild mushrooms. Oh yeah, and that brings up a point. I'll mention this first about wild harvesting. Maybe some people out there, they like to wild harvest. Me also, I love to wild harvest small fruits, things like wild blueberries and blackberries and raspberries, as well as wild mushrooms. The best thing that I can say about wild harvesting, and this is my, my advice, is observe your environment. If you have a lot of beings other than you that are eating those fruits or mushrooms, leave some. Don't harvest them all. I mean, it's a, it seems like a no-brainer, but you would be shocked to see people, especially people that have a wild harvesting business, who just harvest everything in its wake. But they don't leave anything for the beings that live there. So then the little beings are, are struggling to get through their time. So if you notice that there are beings that are eating the wild blueberries, the wild blackberries, the wild raspberries, don't take them all. And if you notice that there are beings that are really, really into something, like we have beings here that love the choke cherries. For whatever reason, that's the preferred chair that's the preferred fruit they don't even touch the blackberries that's why i don't feel bad about harvesting them they almost don't even touch the wild blueberries so i don't feel bad about harvesting those either but the choke cherries i would because it's not just the chipmunks it's the migrating birds that are fruit eating um, migrants that are traveling on south so i don't harvest those even though i'm sure they would make quite a nice uh, jam or comfort or prefer pre preserves or I could freeze them uh, and then make pies in the winter time. It's best to let the little beings have them. A lot do fall um, and they do, but then even if they do fall, they do compost into the ground. So it creates nourishment for the soil microorganisms. So it all works in its system, right? So observation is great. Wild mushrooms. This is another one of my pet peeves about wild harvesters. Please, 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 if you're a wild uh, harvester of mushrooms, do not harvest every single one. Um, even though all the mushrooms that we see, you can kind of consider them to be the flower bud uh, and the mycelium is underneath the ground sort of as a mat and then it pops up its mushroom and that's what we eat. If some of them die, it'll actually create more, um, it'll create more food for the microorganisms and it will create actually uh, mycelium more mycelium for that mycelium to expand. So my preferred, my favorite is chanterelles and every now and then, or this year has been pretty phenomenal. I will find patches of chanterelles everywhere. And yeah, so uh, my, my general rule is I harvest about 50%. So if there's two, I harvest one. Easy enough to understand, right? <laughs> and then that way, then if there are others and it is very interesting. And if there are some that, you, let's say you're you're just learning, and this is great. Let's say you want to bring some in because you don't know and you want to open up your mushroom guide and you want to make a spore print so, you're, so you can confirm that it's actually an edible species of mushroom uh, based on the color. Well, 
let's say you're you're out and you see some some bull eats. Uh, we call them uh, septameric. Uh, so it's a very very tasty, huge capped mushroom. Kind of has the taste of a portobello a little bit uh, when you grill it up. Me, it's not my preferred, but for another being, it is. The the red squirrels really really love the bull eats and you can see them running through the forest with these <laughs> mushrooms bigger than them uh as they're as they're nourishing themselves on these mushrooms and if you're even more observant especially if you live in my neck of the woods you'll notice that in the trees this year there's almost no pine cones pine cones are the number one food source for the red squirrel because there's so much protein and so much carbohydrates in those nuts that they're they're pulling out probably eating a little bit of bugs too but all those nuts that they're pulling out uh that they can live and sustain themselves all throughout the winter off those cones but this year there are none so they're going to need the other food sources like the choke cherries like the mushrooms so as i say if you're out in the forest and, and you see wild mushrooms and you're into it, please only harvest 50% and leave, leave the rest for all other beings that live there. Yes, Nan, I'm with you. Love caring for little beings all the time. It's one of my preferred ways of being. So, all right. So we're talking about preservation. Uh, we talked about drying. Brings up a question, another one from Jean. What is the best use of dried zucchini? Ah, oh, dried zucchini. I love dried zucchini. So my favorite method of using dried zucchini is you're doing your tomato sauce in the wintertime, your spaghetti sauce. And as the tomatoes are boiling or are bubbling, you just throw a nice handful of your dried zucchinis in there. You can also put it in chilies. You can put it in soups. You can really put it in anything, anything that you would like zucchini. And you can even eat them as dried chips. The sweetness is concentrated in the zucchini. Zucchini, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't consider a very, very, very sweet fruit, but it is sweet, and the concentration of the sweetness comes out when it's dry. So you go, just like it does with uh, cherry tomatoes and the ground cherries, they get really, really sweet when you dry them. So we talked about that. We talked about drying. We we talked about how to store it afterwards. But let's talk about something we haven't talked about. Let's talk about canning. Um, canning is one of those things that our great grandparents or grandparents did. Maybe if we're lucky, our parents did it too and showed us the way, but my parents sure didn't. So I learned it from a friend who learned it from her grandparents. And there are many, many methods. Uh, we here have tried to simplify the process. So I'm going to explain it to you, but I can't say that you should or shouldn't use it just because you should do your own research and what you prefer. There are, there is a concern with canning that you could get what's called as botulism, which is when bacteria gets and sort of proliferates in a can of anything that you've canned. However, normally botulism confirms in an aerobic environment where there's still air getting into the, the food that you're processing. So it means that the canning lid isn't completely sealed. And since it isn't completely sealed, bacteria is able, air is able to get in. It creates bacterial element. That's botulism. You open it up. They say you can't smell it, but when you have a bad can of tomatoes or a, a lid that's popped, and if, you know, when I, if you've done any canning, you know what I'm talking about. The canning lid pops up, pops down, pops down when it's sealed, pops up when it's open. Um, you open it up and, and the, the lid isn't sealed. Instead of going, it actually just opens up and you can tell like the, the sauce or whatever has an off coloration. It, it, it just doesn't look appealing. So they say you can't smell it, but you can definitely notice it. Anyway, look at, there are two places that you can look. The USDA uh, in the United States has a website on canning. It's actually called USDA Canning. And Canada government also has one on canning safe and best practices. But I'm going to go ahead and explain our practice because we learned this from a farm that we were at. and We use it now and we find it quite effective. So we wash all of our canning jars. So all of our mason jars, whether one liter or 500 milliliters, one quarter, one pint. 
We put them at the oven at 215 degrees, which will help sterilize them, 215 degrees Fahrenheit, and we'll sterilize them for an hour. Uh, after which we're boiling down, let's say we're just doing tomatoes. We boil down our tomatoes. Tomatoes are very acid, so usually you're not going to have a lot of botulism problems. But in order to aid um, uh, the process of, of creating a little bit more acid, there's a couple of things that always get added. Salt, which aids in preservation, and uh, lemon juice. So if you're doing tomatoes or say you're doing salsa, it's always a good idea to put in some sort of vinegar or juice. And anytime you're canning something that has vinegar in it, the chances of getting botulism are really, really small. The chances of any kind of bacterial problem are almost nil because you're adding that extra bit of acid. Anyway, so let's say we're doing tomatoes. We're going to boil it, boil it, boil it, boil it. We're going to get it as hot as 215 degrees boiling point. I think boiling point is 221. But anyway, you're going to get it to that boiling point, boil for a while. All the while, you're going to take all the canning lids, which are um, those sort of round, uh, Bernadine or Ball or whoever, uh, the round little lids, and then the screw tops. And we're going to, the screw tops we're going to wash. The lids we're going to put into a chaudron, um, a pot of boiling water, along with all of the necessary things that we use to can with. So if we're using, um, a uh, ladle to scoop the scoop the tomatoes. We're going to go ahead and sterilize that as well as um, sort of the canning funnel. And if you've ever used it, you've seen it. It's kind of got a wide, it sits right into the canning jar and has kind of a wide, uh, wide mouth like this or a wide receptacle that you can then ladle your tomato juice in, ladle your tomatoes in. All of that gets sterilized for at least 30 minutes. And then from there, it's just a process of doing it as quickly as you can. So you take out your canning jars with a hot mitt. You put them onto a cutting board. You, you put in your receptacle, your, your funnel. You take your ladle and you put your tomatoes in. Then with a couple of forks that have also been sterilized or one fork, you go ahead and uh, take up the canning lid and put it right on top of the jar and seal it up. And there you go. And you put it aside until you hear it go. And then you know that they're sealed. The best advice I can say about canning, if you do, um, if you have done canning in the past, you always end up with all of these extra lids. Uh, keep them. Use them for other things when you're storing dry goods. Um, but if you, but if you uh, are going to can, the best deal is to buy new canning lids every year. Best idea is to try to buy them into the spring. In the spring, they're a lot cheaper than they are in the fall, especially during the pandemic. At the first in 2020, I found this super shocking. You could, you could go to the store during the pandemic. Everybody wanted to can, and uh, a package of 12 canning lids was seven or eight bucks. You going back in the spring? The same package was 250. So there you go. So buy things in advance if you're thinking that you're going to be doing canning and uh, you'll be fine. After that, after they go and they're, they're sealed um, and you'll see the lid will, the ones that aren't sealed will still have a little point, a little like dimple on top. But when it sucks down in, it's completely sealed. Go ahead and store it in a, in a place again, 16 to 18 degrees out of the light, always out of the light. And uh, it, it'll do you just fine. We have cans of Mexican salsa that are still good from last year's canning of what, October. So we're talking 10 months, 11 months, and they're still good. I would go through, I wouldn't can, uh, and here's the thing about canning. Sometimes we get all excited. Let's say we have an amazing harvest of strawberries. One year I made, I don't know, 20 jars, 20 uh, half pint jars of <laughs> strawberry jam. And after about two months looking at all this strawberry jam that was in my cupboard, I realized that I don't eat that much strawberry jam. <laughs> I like strawberry jam. I like putting on my pancakes. I like putting it on my waffles. I like putting it on my toast, but I just don't eat that much strawberry jam. So better is to just freeze the strawberries and then you can use it in cobbler or you can use it and make jam later, but you can make it kind of as you go. It's also really good in smoothies. So freezing is always better not as um, sort of end of the world safe, if you want to put it like that. It's always better to dry stuff because even if all of a sudden we lose electricity, 
well, we don't need a generator to run our, run our, our freezer. If we have everything dry, then we don't need to worry about it because everything's dry. But not everything tastes the same dry. If for all sorts of soup ingredients now, for example, drying celery and carrots and onions that, that aren't, even though you can store them, but not celery, for example, but carrots and onions you can store. But let's say you wanted to dry all your soup ingredients. I, you actually kind of see sometimes these mixes of farmer's markets, which I find super cool. You'll, find, you'll see like dried mixes of soup where it just says add boiling water or boil it for a while and it'll all reconstitute. Yeah, you can do that. You can you can get creative with your with your preservation. Uh, refrigerator pickles. Yeah, this is one that I came across about 18, 19 years ago, and I've been doing it ever since. I love it. So I love dill pickles, but I could never see about canning them and keeping that crunch. It seemed like every time I canned a dill pickle, um, like boiled up the, the the water and the and the vinegar and the dill to go ahead and get I, it would just make the cucumber a little mushy. It just never was, it never was what I wanted. So um, I'm sorry, we're going over eight o'clock. I'm watching the time of the show because I was five minutes late because of the technical difficulties. Anyway, I'm going to go an hour. If anybody needs to leave, leave. I understand. Um, so refrigerator pickles. So basically this is one to one, um, one part apple cider vinegar to one part water with a tablespoon of salt. Um, and thank you, Jorge. Awesome. Glad to have you with us from Mexico City. I'm glad you subscribed. Um, so one part vinegar, one part water, a tablespoon of salt. Usually I do two parts or two cups of apple cider vinegar. Too. So anyway, one to one to one tablespoon. Put that into a pot, boil it and uh then let it cool and in the after that you're get, then you can go ahead and do your dill pickles and this is called refrigerator dill pickles so you can do small like cornichon or um like pickling cucumbers and you can put them in whole or you can cut them into slices or cut them in spears whatever you want or one of my personal favorites is jalapenos if you like spicy Take a whole jalapeno, just cut off the top just a little bit so you have just a little bit of opening so that the liquid can get in. Make sure the liquid is cool. Pack your canning jar, the same canning jars that you would use to actually can with the jalapenos. Pour the water over the top, all the way to the top. Seal it, put it in the fridge. Two months later, they're ready. Put a date on it so you know. Refrigerator pickles. You can do this with... with Dill pickles, um, you can do this with, or you can do this with cucumbers, you can do this with beans, dilly beans, any kind of beans, you can do this with okra, you can do it with um, any kind of hot pepper, very cool. It's a very cool way of keeping that crispness of the vegetables that are not going to last that long in cold storage. Even though hot peppers can last about a month after a while, after about a month, they're done. One last one is lacto-fermentation. Uh, and if anyone out there does it, here is one of my favorite books, Wild Fermentation by Sandor Katz. Uh, it's been around for a while. This is the new edition. Uh, I don't do a lot of, we don't do a lot of uh, fermentation, lacto-fermentation, but the great thing, but we do do some. We do do uh, kimchi, which is a Korean staple made with carrots and, and um let me think about this. Cabbage, carrots, daikon, some sort of radishes, and uh, hot peppers made into a, like a spicy um, side dish. Or sauerkraut, which is uh, from Germany, and uh, made into a crock. And you're just basically adding salt and waiting until it ferments. The fan most fantastic thing about eating fermented fermented foods, there's two. One is it, there's it's probiotic, so it, it creates... Uh, it, it, it allow it gives stuff for the microorganism. <laughs> yeah, Veg Meg, it's a great book. Um, it all the microorganisms in your gut feed on those probiotics, and it makes them healthier. It also increases the vitamin C content of all cabbages, carrots, and um, radishes. 
So increases it to such a level that I think that just um, maybe a quarter cup of, of sauerkraut is going to give you 100% of your vitamin C, which is fantastic for the winter time when um, it's, it's fantastic in the winter time when you are uh, in need of an extra boost. Uh, one last question. Does food lose nutritional value when dried? I don't think so. I think if anything, it actually um, condenses the sweetness. I mean, obviously, if you take a whole zucchini and you condense it into one small little strips of zucchini, you would have to then compare. I don't know if you compare it by weight, but I don't think so. I don't think it loses much. So there you go. You might lose the fiber. Um, and maybe a few other things, but I don't think you're going to be losing much else. I mean, think of a dried bean. Um, if you germinate it, um, it's, you're, you're, you actually have more nutrition in a dried bean than you do in a, in a, in a, in a fresh bean. So if you're eating a bush bean and then let the seeds dry, you actually have more nutrition in it. So maybe it's more concentrated. So actually it's probably the other way around. Now that I think about it logically on the show. You probably have more nutrition in, in foods when they are dry. When you reconstitute them, I don't know what happens, but don't quote me on that. But you can do your research on that one. So there you go. That's the show for tonight. Thank you, as always, for joining us. An event coming up. I find this really, really cool. September 28th, that is in, what, about three and a half weeks. At noon, Nation Rising presents A Revolution in Agriculture is Coming with MP Tijir de Grit from the Dutch government as he talks about their government's plan uh, that has been confirmed to radically reduce the number of animals raised in their country to fight climate change. Very, very interesting. The progressive Dutch government is doing great things over there. They're, they're, they are probably the most progressive in the world right now when it ta when talking about eliminating animal agriculture. So if you're into it, check it out. Nation Rising, September 28th. And my next show, September 15th, Vigena Grows Hour, number 16. I can't believe it's number 16. In bed composting, seeding winter cover crops, and putting the gardens to bed. Why we should, methods of doing so. All the news. And that's going to be what it's all about. So as always, thank you so much. It's always great to have you with me. Sorry I was a little bit late today, but I'm glad I got it working. Now I know the secret. Um, I wish you all a wonderful two weeks. Peace. Another thing I wish for is peace on this heaven we call earth. So thank you and have a lovely night.